And also, when would you need it, to be honest? When I'm being tortured, I guess. I'd seen the new season. I just finished it over the weekend wow. and I absolutely loved it. Um, so my first question is, can we talk about the Footloose scene? Because it's amazing. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, good. Good. Did it throw you off? It did. I had. I really was like, what are we doing? Like, what's happening here? But I, it really, I've watched it multiple times now. It makes me laugh out loud. Oh, good. Yeah, because once you understand why it's happening, it's mm -hmm. really funny. Yes. Yeah. We, um, I know Steve had, he was like, there's going to be a big dance in the beginning. It's a big, big dance. So you better be ready. You're going to be ready. You need to be ready. You know, so we did a lot, a lot of rehearsals, a lot of Zoom rehearsals after quarantine. Then we met together and we did like about, I think in total, it might have been somewhere around five weeks of rehearsal. Mm -hmm. to, to get it to the point of being in sync and learning all these moves. Um, but, you know, it was, it was kind of like going back to the roots of like the Tiffany song, you mm -hmm. know? And, but it became something bigger because obviously Tiffany was like their own private moment, you know, no one's supposed to be watching them. And now they're dancing against these right. frogs. Um, yeah, I, I think the reaction, because I have the screeners also, and, and I showed it to a family member and then they were like, what is this you know and and they're but their mouth was like open mm -hmm. you know and they're like and they're almost a little bit angry that it's turning into a musical and then when it, they find the and then when they find the reveal they're like oh my god this is so funny and then what even what's even funnier is that it's San Diego's head yes yeah, and that's yeah, and her, just Jamie's look to Diego when after it's done, it's like, oh, and he's like, just a little kissy face. It's like, damn, yeah, you know, so it seems pretty on like point with the actual dance from Footloose. Is it like step for step the same thing? Yes, uh, so almost dance. I mean, uh, John, who was the, the, the choreographer, he was. I mean, he, he really wanted to kind of immerse our best strengths and also keep it very, it was, you know, kind of to the point in terms of like those steps, especially that end sequence where like we're going in this V heading towards the camera yeah. right before Diego realizes this is all uh, an illusion. Um, that was step by step, step to step of the Footloose thing, you know, and uh, and some of those, some of those moves in the beginning also, but, you know, John really kind of, brought in his own flavor and kind of allowed us to feel comfortable enough to, you know, gave us, it was, it was really patient with us. It was so many of us. Oh my it God. looks like it was so fun to film. Like it, it's like, I will, I was like, I wish I was there. I wish I was in the daily <laughs> when we were shooting on the day is just, it was the funniest thing. It, the, one of the funniest things is watching Luther go from like, Oh, okay. We're going to face off. And he has this very serious face and he starts pumping his hand because he's dancing. And when I saw it, when I saw that on the day on the monitor, I, I couldn't stop laughing. I was like, oh my God, what are we oh, doing? Yeah. It's hilarious. My favorite part is actually you, or when Diego says, oh shit, we're really good at this. <laughs> <laughs> he was so happy with himself. Yeah. Um, so throughout the se throughout the three seasons, we kind of see a different version of Diego. So what would you say your favorite version of Diego is? Well, I, I, I mean, I don't know about favorite, but I think this is the right one to be in right now. Mm -hmm. You know, because each year, each season, I think, especially season two, where like it was a big jump from like you getting to see who Diego really is and how he, um, what he really wants. And you get to see his storyline and really kind of let him loose. And in this one, it's, it's interesting because you, you, you think that that's where Diego is the sweet spot and that's where people like him. So let's keep pushing in that direction. But they did it. They grounded him. Mm -hmm. You know, they gave him a responsibility. They gave him something to be um, selfless, you know, and, and, to, and to allow growth within his own, uh, you know, childlike obsession of trying to save and do things and being like, oh no, now you have to, you got to be a father now. Yeah. And, yeah. And having his own fears of, uh, of how his dad was and how him not wanting to repeat those things. 
And so I felt like it was just timely from, you know, just, just for an aspect of like, you know, you can only fight so many times and seek revenge so many times. It's like, it, it was a nice change of pace. Yeah, I actually think this one is my favorite version of Diego. Although I did love him with Patch, like his sweet moments with Patch in season one were some of my favorites. Oh, really? So, so season three, like it was like because he's funnier, right? He's like he's, he's a little... funnier and he's more. He's just he seems more relaxed, and he he is like as much as he does stuff, you know, that's like not typically what a parent would do with Stanley, he's still, yeah. he can tell he cares about him and he, and he, you know, he, he wants to be a good dad. So it yeah. was refreshing to see that. Um, um, what was it like bringing Javon Walton into the fold? Cause he's so much younger. Well, I guess not that much younger than Aiden, but. Yeah, I mean, but we, we've we already, you know, I, we worked with Aiden since he was 14. Some, oh, some, yeah. So we already knew how to you know, working all adults and working with some a, a child actor and a, a talented one also be at that. So when when Juana came, Javon, uh, it was the same thing, you know, and he came in with such energy and such positivity and such a fan of the show. And all I had to do with him was just play. Mm -hmm. you know? And he's a professional boxer. I mean, he's about to be like a professional professional really? boxer, but he's been boxing his whole life and he's a phenomenal athlete. And so, you know, you, you can already feel he has this childlike aggression mm -hmm. you know, that, that Stanley already carries. And there's nothing, you know, when I would go to work with him, it was just like, when we would work, it was just like the funnest days. Yeah, he seems like he's a good time. And it's so nice to see him in a different role than, you know, his role on Euphoria. Euphoria where he barely, he barely spoke, you know, if he did, it was like really <laughs> short. Like, I wasn't really sure what he sounded like, to be honest, until I heard him on. <laughs> yeah, well, if you see him now, he's a big, he's so tall now, like compared to like when we did the show. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because he was quite a bit shorter than you. And yeah, he was a baby, yeah. Yeah, that's funny. So, okay, so I'm going to go back to Patch, because she was, I was really upset when Patch died. But do you think we'll ever see Patch again? Because I felt like Diego had a really good connection with her. And with a show like this that has time travel. Yeah. Like almost like anybody could be brought back. I think so. I think anybody could. I mean, obviously, that would have to be more on, on Blackman's mm -hmm. end if he wants to br bring her back. But I think basically where Diego is at with Lila, if Patch comes, it would just be a triangle of, the, of, of a romance. And I've seen that so much now that I I don't feel like that would be uh, creative enough for like the Umbrella show. But obviously if Patch was to come back, you know, for like an episode and have some kind of closure, I think that would be really, really sweet. Yes. But to have Patch and then Lila and then wait, Lila pregnant and then Patch over yeah. here. You're kind of like, been done. Yeah, it's a little, it's, it, it becomes, it could be a little so. Hopefully Steve doesn't watch this and be like, that's a great idea. I'm going I'm <laughs> to put that into the season. <laughs> Just put a little name like Whitney at the bottom when he did. Yeah, yeah. It was a good credit Whitney. Was cool. <laughs> so I know from the comics, Diego has different powers. Oh, well, he's got, I guess, an additional power where he can breathe underwater. Mm -hmm. in the comics. Was there a reason, like what, did Steve Blackman stray, like stay away from superpowers that would kind of make the show more fantasy than it is? Because it's unique in the sense that it's a superhero show, but the characters are so relatable. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't remember if Steve said specifically why there he was. We we have an established a breathing underwater scene, mm -hmm. but I kind of like that he hasn't gone to that point. I really enjoy the groundedness of, of, you know, just having that one little thing. And mm -hmm. it kind of gives him a, a almost like um, inferiority as a superhero because he just yeah. can handle knives and he can fight very well. Um, and also, I think it's just a lot cheaper than to like be shooting yeah. underwater. And also, when would you need it, to be honest? When I'm being <laughs> tortured, I guess. Maybe. And put it to a bathtub and realizing they're like, oh, he's still alive. You can. Oh, we can't kill him after all. You can breathe in the water. Yeah. Uh, so, are like, what would you say 
how has the challenge of playing Diego changed? How has it changed from season one to season three? Like, was it tougher or was it easier to go into season three with this new attitude and kind of responsibility? Well, I feel like it's it's not so much that it's been easier, it's been more relaxed uh, going from season one to season three. Because season one, um, I feel like I, you know, the, the this kind of tough, uh, you know, I don't want to talk to anyone, brooding kind of character was something that, you know, it, it already popped off the page. And then as the season got along, I think Diego got more complex. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think that's where the relaxation comes, where like, he doesn't always have to be this one way. And, and I think you see that in season three, where like, there's a lot more joy and fun to play within like, with Klaus, with Luther, with Lila, with Stanley, mm -hmm. with Allison, you know, or with Victor, you know, and his his dynamic with each one of them is not like, I hate you, you yeah. left me, you left the family, goodbye. No, it's like, I feel like he connects more with his family now. And that makes, more, that that. makes sense too, you know, cause I saw where Justin Min said that it was kind of exhausting to play Ben this season because it's hard to be mad all the time. It's hard to come across as angry and, you know, out for revenge or whatever. So I could see. Yeah, I and, it, probably and as tough as Justin say it was, I mean, he was a little marshmallow, you know. That's, oh, that's, yeah, he can tell when he talks in like his interviews. Like, yeah, oh as soon God. as he yells, as soon as he yells, cut, everyone just wants to hug him. They're like, <laughs> hey. it's like, I know you didn't mean that. Come here. You didn't oh, mean yeah. That. Yeah. <laughs> So what was your favorite scene from, I'm going to, we'll do a two-parter. What was your favorite scene to film from season three? And then we'll do one like all-time favorite scene. Um, my favorite scene from season three probably was either the dance scene, the beginning. Mm -hmm. We did that. Or I, I, I'm trying to think. What was it like another really good scene? Oh, you know what scene? The scene where um, where Lila tells me that we're going to go to the bachelor party and that, that I should get ready. And I'm like, I don't want to go. <laughs> that scene. Because it was just funny. It was like Paco Cabeza directed that. And I thought it was really good how we kind of found it to be like not make it cheesy, but also add this this tone of absurdity, especially with his pants being down at the end where he says, oh, right. Yeah. It was so good. I, I really enjoyed shooting it. And when I saw it, I was like, oh, it did it felt like how it how it was on the day. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So when I watched the show, Hotel or Obsidian, it gives off the same vibes as like the Cecil Hotel. That's what it reminded mm. me of. You think that was intentional? Do you know if that was like what Steve Blackman was going for or if you guys felt that way too? No, I mean, I, I we did feel like, you know, because what we see, I think the Rich Ramirez sir, I think I, I had seen it while we were shooting Umbrella that season. So there was like, oh, like there is this element of like a creepy hotel where there is danger at every corner and everything kind of feels a little bit like time warped. But Hotel Oblivion on the comic book was a hotel that kind of kept all of these villains prisoners. Mm -hmm. So... I, I felt like when they built the hotel, it was to give a little bit of that homage to Oblivion. Mm -hmm. uh, but maybe, yeah, maybe there was a little bit of this kind of do killers really. Yeah, like I was watching, like that was the vibe it gave me. And my coworker who had screeners too, we had talked about it. We were, I was like, did you feel like it was the Cecil? <laughs> and she said, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Right, yeah. So the soundtrack of the Umbrella Academy, all three seasons, is one, in my opinion, it is one of the best soundtracks of any show out there. Like I download the soundtracks immediately on my Spotify as soon as they come out and they're like on a constant rotation. Oh. Do you guys get any say in like thinking like, oh, this would be a good song for this scene? Because it a lot of times the song juxtaposes against the what's happening in the scene, which makes it really clever and yeah. Memorable. I think uh, I haven't. I know I haven't. I know that um, because the stuff that I hear on the page never really matches how I interpret it. So I would probably end up picking like a very obvious song to play over the track. Yeah. And I feel like Steve kind of subverts that. Um, I do know that I, I think I believe that Elliot did, I think in season one, 
uh, he did send Steve a, a song. I don't know what it's called though, but it was the, it's the song where Klaus comes back from Vietnam and he's holding the briefcase and he's crying. Yeah. It's a very beautiful song. Uh, and, and I believe Elliot was the one that presented that to Steve. I don't know for what scene specifically, but he's uh, he showed it to, to Steve Black at that point. Yes, I know exactly what scene that is. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. So do you guys have any idea what the music's gonna be beforehand? You don't, or is it just waiting? on the script that'll they'll, they'll have they'll have a, a like a, the perfect world. This is the song. And I say about maybe like 90% of the time, I think it's 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 there. And then when the edit comes, I wanna say, you know, like I said, there's there is some changes, obviously, because I'm guessing because of copyrights or you know, licensing fees. Yeah. But yeah, they're all there. So does that influence how you, your performance at all? No, 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 no because then if you're, because then you're, you're playing to the song. And so it doesn't really, you're not really juxtaposing yourself to the song. You're kind of yeah. going with the song and then they'll probably pick another song. If you, <laughs> the only one, obviously, you know, Footloose was kind of the one that we kind of were like, oh, we're, we're, we're yeah. prepping to this song specifically. Yeah. Basically. Yeah, so you got like the Kevin Bacon role too in that, I guess, because it was Diego's. It was, and, I, and you know, I, I had to realize what was Diego's fascination towards Kevin Bacon. Was it? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I've seen his, I've seen, I've seen a lot of his films. I mean, Invisible Man, I don't know. He, play, he did play that actually. Yeah, yeah, he did. Hollow Man, is that? Oh, that Tremors, he was in Tremors also. Tremor as I was obsessed with as a kid. That was a big one. Uh, Mystic River. He was a detective uh -huh. in Mystic River. It was great in that. Uh -huh. um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, but maybe, you know, maybe he kind of wishes his dad was uh, Kevin Bacon. Maybe? maybe. I wonder if I wonder if he has, like, secret dreams of being, like, a dancer or something, because he, he really loves to bust out his moves when he gets the chance. I mean, I really hope the next time if Diego gets another no opportunity, it's more like John Travolta and Saturday Night Fever. You know? Yeah, that could work. It could. Yeah. yeah. I love it. Love it. And every time you watch that scene, there is something new to look at or to catch that someone is doing. Oh, great. Oh, yeah. dope. That's tight. Hilarious. So what can you tell us about your new series, Poker Face, if anything? Well, I, I just know that they're just getting stacked. They're just stacking the deck for everyone to come in and like, mm -hmm. like do a phenomenal job. And um, all I can say, I think, and I think this is a line too. It's like, you know, Natasha Leone is like a detective. Okay. Yeah. That's what, that's all I could find was that it was a police, it's like a procedural show. But is, it is, uh, it is, I mean, I, I, oh my God, it's so good, man. It's and you started, have you started filming for that? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So what's it like working with uh, Natasha and like Joseph Gordon Love? I mean, there's like. Oh my God, yeah, there, and Stephanie Sue also, who did Everything Everywhere All at Once, also okay. she's in the, yeah, I mean, it's, you, I mean, I had a, you have, you have to pinch yourself, you know, like, especially working with Ryan Johnson, who I've been a fan of for like, you know, 15 years now. Mm -hmm. um, and and getting to be directed by him and working opposite Joseph Gordon Levitt and Natasha Leon is so fun and so nice and so talented and Sue also Stephanie she's also great um, but uh, yeah I mean I, I you know I think as the show comes out there'll be more details to arise within that but that's as far as like I feel comfortable enough to yeah yeah I don't want to get you in trouble I don't want you to say anything yeah. you have to say. So is there, are there, have you got any other projects like in the works that are upcoming that you can tell us about? Uh, yeah, I have a thing with Roku and Christoph Waltz called Most Dangerous Game. I, I think, okay. it, yeah, it comes out, it comes out, I think this year it comes out. I mean, they I haven't. It, they send me, sometimes they'll send me their screener, so I'll have to look for it. I'll keep an eye on it. Oh, yeah, yeah, check it out. Um, yeah, it's the sequel to, because Liam Hensworth did the first one mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'm doing the second one. Nice. That's exciting. Yeah. So are there any words or any plans for how long Umbrella Academy is going to last? Like I know this is season three, but do you know if Steve's got a bunch of plans for? I mean, I've, 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 I've heard they got at least one more in the bank if, if we get greenlit. I will drive to Netflix myself. Please do so. I mean, it'd be nice to, it'd be nice to, it'd be nice to have a steady job. You know? Right, right. That's 
it's always a bonus. Right? But also, but also the opportunity to extend the 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 lineage of what Umbrella tells and where it can mm -hmm. go for next season. Yeah, do you know is Gerard Way? He's not done with the comics though, right? He's got another no, one in no. the world. But I, you guys have veered off from. I know, like the Sparrow Academy is not introduced till the end of Hotel Oblivion. Yeah, so I don't know exactly what they have planned, but mm -hmm. yeah, it has veered off in a very like. You know, it kind of keeps the nostalgia about the show. Um, uh, the show, the show kind of keeps the nostalgia about the comic book, but it's not, it's not yeah. true to court anymore. For sure. So, what do you see in the future for Diego as a as a dad and being in the umbrella? I mean, how will that work? I don't know. I, I'm curious to to what will happen to him. I'm really, I'm really hoping that there is a a version in like another universe where he somehow finds himself in Mexico. I would like that. And see how he interacts with his own culture. And obviously he is, you know, he's, he's an outsider, you know, but also somewhat yeah. of a, an insider in there. And just see what happens. I mean, I, I think, I think you know, Diego and Luther in Mexico would be really funny. <laughs> crack me up. Do, so did you know, like, did you work in the, fact that like all your suitcases or luggage in your promos mm. had like little stickers which i assumed was where each one of you all like each one of the characters were from you know and then the only one we get to see get to see explored though is klaus like so that like did you were you thinking that there'd be more with each person i was there? hoping so yeah yeah i, was I would love to see everybody back in like home base or whatever Oh my God, that's that's what I that's what I feel like. But also, part of what makes the show really special is that it's the banter between all of us together in the same room mm -hmm. too. So, yeah. so that's good. that's I think that's where the, the the sweet spot is. If I'm if I'm honest with you, but I hope that we we get an opportunity to kind of go into each direction, you know, yeah, try to find the roots. Yeah.